that question. So when considering the university as an exterior, um, and yesterday we talked or we heard a little bit about the um, lifespan of, of construction being that 30 to 50 years, the university seems to stand um, as an exception to that. And I wonder if you can maybe speak to the, the aesthetics that um, a university has separate of the world because of that life of the construction for the buildings themselves? That is a great question, and I did mention deferred maintenance there <laughs> at the end. Um, so I immediately started thinking about sort of classical or neo-Gothic architecture favored by so many um, architects commissioned to build a campus building or um, when one university modeled itself on another, so like Duke University with the Neo-Gothic is modeled on Princeton's Neo-Gothic, which I imagine was, so there's a sort of recursiveness in the aesthetic, is that what you're thinking of? Um, so that, and, and I did say also, I don't know if you could tell one university from another there. I did put a few landmarks in, like the cornfields on the University of Illinois campus, but um, there is a sort of, it, it, if I put this in the terms that Slaughter did might think of, there's that first um, stage of globalization, the classical theology or cosmogony that we see in like the figures of alma mater that I display and the neoclassical architecture where that early idea of what a university is is a sort of neoclassical aesthetic. So those buildings announce that. that as I have the Columbia University Library up there with the words Virgil with um, those classical authors also written on the exterior of the building. So I think that is an important part of the campus aesthetic and extending well beyond the 30 to 50 year lifestyle. And to go to the opposite extreme, which I love to do, um, I won't bring Hagrid into it, but to go to the, uh, another opposite extreme, the Gary building that, that was depicted up there um, on the MIT campus was subject to a lawsuit because of how difficult and costly it's proven to, to maintain. So um, that could be uh, creating kind of fear of too much extremely modern architecture on the campus. It's, right now, it's really a sign of prestige, I think, if you have a Gary building or anything like that on your campus. That's, that's Ivy League stuff, right? But then it's even, MIT came to rue the day. And I don't know whether the lawsuits over maintenance cause more publicity than the really startling beauty of that building. But I hope that answers your question. I have a general question for the three of you as a way to perhaps make a distinction between the first two papers and the third. Uh, in the first two uh, papers, you talked about the, the let's say, the, the subaltern, I, for lack of other terms. Uh, and But the campus as a space of resistance, because this is what kind of you are all sharing, in a sense, resistance and becoming as to or improvisation and surviving as a way of resistance. Um, uh, the campus represents a, an authority. It is an exterior because of the privilege. Uh, whether it's ivory tower uh, in, in the sense of uh, Ivy League private or even state and land grant democratized space. So um, while there, there is this shared common theme of resistance, resistance comes out here in many different ways. Uh, so maybe maybe this is something that you can all reflect upon. Um, I don't know, just as, as, a, as a way to, to put these uh, papers into conversation. I'm just going to say one thing, and then I don't, I, I want to be quiet and listen for a while, but what I was thinking while Alice talked about the hotel and the lesson and the, these um, kind of 
transformative spaces, much like a college campus in some ways. Um, and I think an important difference, and I will grant you that it's a sign of privilege, is the extended length of time that a college campus is designed to, to shelter or um, teach in. And that, you know, having that time to set aside is, is a huge privilege as well, right? That's not for everybody. So these more discreet units, like the one hour weekly lesson, um, are doing something else that's really important as well. Um, and probably really important at more formative stages of life that you talk about with going with your father. One, I adored your talk. I have so many questions, but I'll wait to talk to me. But about this, um, I think your question about campuses is really important. And if I, if they're talking about Detroit, had they talking about Washington, D.C. as a black city, then campus life would have come in much to play. And my, my second novel, Pushkin and the Queen of Spades, has pages and pages of not chapter, of looking at campus space at bits and the impact it's had in the city of Nashville. So I think one of the interesting things about Detroit as, um, and black Detroit from you know, this very particular novelistic perspective I'm engaging it is that the places of resistance aren't the ones that I think people classically, the dance school, if you saw a picture of it, it's been taken down. It, it looks like a, it's a nondescript but very powerful space because it's a secret community center. One of the things I didn't tell you probably about Ziggy Johnson because he wouldn't have wanted to be told as a first thing, he was probably a closeted gay man. But this construction, it wasn't how he led and in the day, 1968. So this private life, um, which, which I love that you talk about, cities keep their mysteries and their secrets. But the city, Detroit, I think would be a very different city if there um, had been a campus in it. I'm curious as to which black cities in the large way that you looked at it do have, I mentioned Washington, have important campuses as part of what you might I mean, I think I think there are there are there are there are some universities where it's difficult to tell. I mean, I would. I mean, I, I agree with with much of what you're 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 saying. Is, is it, is it, but I think there are some campuses where it's hard to tell where the campus begins and where it, where it ends. Um, and I think in those kinds of situations, it's really. These are really important kinds of political and de design decisions. Uh, where do buildings stay open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for different kinds of purposes? Uh, where does the university allow itself to be appropriated by the surrounds in different kinds of ways without necessarily the university's extensionality being a colonizing a colonizing one. Um, and those kinds of interfaces can be very tense, very uncertain, but I think also very, very productive. Um, and I think, I, think, I think in many instances governments know that because, for example, in Jakarta, they moved the National University out of the center of the city way out to the, to, to, the, to the outskirts. In Kinshasa, they moved the university from the inside the city way to the outskirts for clear reasons, because they, they felt that it was this particular kind of moment, this kind of particular process that could ramify <coughs> that the university simply was not just there to train students to fit the machine, that it was a, it could be a kind of volatile and productive space without clear, clear boundaries. Um, and, and yeah, I think that's a, um, but it's, look, I mean, look at, I mean, if you've been following the situation in India over the, over, over the, over the last month, I mean, the, the Modi government that really wants to use the, the insert itself strongly in the federal universities as a way to make sure that these universities in some sense belong to 
a particular articulation of, 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 of the national vision. I mean, this tragedy within the University of Hyderabad where a Dalit student hung himself just because in some ways there was, there's no horizon. You know, there's an affirmative action program which allows large numbers of Dalit students to come into the university system. They have to fight like hell to get some kind of, a, of an education, but then they come out of it with nothing. There's nothing to, nothing to make it worth it. For, 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 for me. Stillborn, in your sense. Interesting. Interesting, yes. yes. Stillborn. Yes. Stillborn, but then there's the useless beauty that you talked about a little bit. Um, how. How did that work out? So, I think that in contrast to the factory worker, um, one, I hope you realize that the whole novel is from this other character's perspective. So, that I was reading with the speech she's giving in Ann Arbor. I think that, that she's very much working with this concept that part of, that Ziggy perceived not being useful. Um, as an act of transgression, that he wasn't, he did not perceive, he was not interested in entertaining white people, he was interested in uh, making his own interior life that he did not share, his own interior psychology and pleasures and awareness be the center of his life, and that he arguably really actually, by doing that, got around double consciousness, and that he did not, but he was, that one of the markers of it for Ziggy Johnson, if you look through his papers, is just, being not useful because slaves, for example, specifically had to be useful. And so he took a power in, in creating um, a kind of a beauty that didn't even appeal. I, I always remember um, moving to Washington, D.C. and seeing the Temptations, I think, were on the, on the Today Show. And my hippie dippy friends were all, you know, all love Bob Dylan and were so shocked and hateful about um, the Temptations and Aretha Franklin because they didn't get the style and they thought it was so quote unquote corny in this man. I love Bob Dylan, but it changed his name and it recreated, no, totally cultivated in the style, affecting this rural um, and very powerful um, cyber. But they couldn't see the beauty in the purple suits and the swirl and the swirl with the danger. The Ziggy thought, thought of it as being the opposite of being in um, an assembly line that was as equally coordinated and the opposite genome field. All right, and a question? Um, yeah, the three are very interesting talks, and there's some interesting intersections with them. Um, I was particularly interested in the discussion about the campus as this special other space that exists within the city. Um, and I'm curious as to how you see this sort of, um, this. there's a, also a critique of that otherness that the university, you know, the, the ivory tower and the isolation of the fact that university professors are out of touch with the realities of the real world, et cetera. And, and, you know, so I'm also interested in, in our, and for, for all of you, because I think it affects all of your discussions, that to me the area of interest is the interfaces, right? The interfaces between these territorial lines that are, are marked, whether it's between campus and the city or whether it's between you know, black space and, and the rest of the space. And, and where you, to me, urban, urbanization is about where you have these flows that are intersecting and confronting one another. And you spoke more about the, the maybe the, in the territory of the campus itself as opposed to the intersections. And I just wondered if you might comment on that or any, for any of you. Last night at dinner, we ended up inadvertently talking about this issue of territoriality. And this, the first thing I'm going to say has got to do mostly with the U.S. And it's an issue that also comes up on Indian reservations, and that is jurisdiction. 
Um, if a crime is committed, uh, we were talking specifically with some um, of the architecture staff here, if a rape occurs or if a, a rape is alleged, who, who has jurisdiction on campus? Um, traditionally, universities have sort of taken that jurisdiction on themselves, right? Is that productive? That, that's an interesting place of interface that, that some of somebody here brought up to me. Um, and of course, there's lots of strife on Indian reservations as well as who has jurisdictions. So that, that kind of space can, can cut both ways, right? Um, I'm not sure that's what you're asking, but um, th that, that is when we start thinking about it as territory and his territory, there are real issues there. Um, also, about income. In the US, again, university endowments, should they pay taxes on them? And if they're not paying taxes on them, what are they keeping all this money for? Why can't they use it to improve access, right? To give more people opportunities. So I basically only think it's interesting that there's all this unsettled, like who has jurisdiction over crimes that happen, I was very distraught when I was speaking to people here when the police shot that 19-year-old kid on campus. I can hardly walk by that space anymore. Did they, you know, why did they do that? Did they need to do that kind of thing? So, so we have, it's, it's still a very ill-defined space in all those kinds of ways. Um, so I'm going to... I think, I think, you know, it, it, you know it, are, there, are there other different ways we can play these interfaces? You know, at UCL, University of College London now, um, it's the expectation. Uh, money is uh, dispersed and distributed, invested in students to the, to the extent to which they participate within startups that then are patented by the university. Uh, it's clear that the, the, the university becomes a, a locus of of, of entrepreneurship. Um, um, is that, a, is that a, a bad thing? Well, prob it probably is, but then there are instances, I know in, in Jakarta, where the university opens up a new campus in a popular neighborhood, and the residents figure out ways to take advantage of all of the ancillary services that can be for Students need to be housed. Students need to be serviced. The particular way in which they aggregate that income, and they can do it either to get rich individually or they can do it through collective trust. The collective trust then are put to work in order to invest in other kinds of, so yes, there's a kind of entrepreneurship that surrounds the university. The university is not the one doing it. It's the, it's, it's, it's the, it's the local residents. Are they equivalent in some way? Yes, they are equivalent in some way. Are they different? Obviously, they're somewhat different, but these are always these are troubling interfaces, but productively, always productively explored. I mean, and I think we we, we need to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think that that can I just say we and we we are kind of authorized to speak for that. I mean, that's one of the privileges we have to speak up about these interfaces and make them as productive as possible. And I guess I'd add, in addition to taking advantage of services, there's usually lots of free things, like museums and performances and things that you can, that the people who live on the outskirts of campus or near the campus can, can use uh, or enjoy. I thought another point that Barbara made that's interesting about universities, again, speaking focused on the states, is it becomes the most international, a very peculiarly international space. Because they're, you're seeking, although it's maybe specific categories of people, but people from uh, as many possible countries in the world uh, coming to one consecrated space. So on one hand, it's incredibly, um, it, it's particularly urban. The other hand, that most of the workers in many cities are particularly local. Are working. And so there's two categories of people in a university. There are the students and the faculty administrators, but then there are also the janitors and the cooks. 
and they are living in a very, there may be some ways in which their workers at Vanderbilt today are living in a quote unquote, a meaningfully said rural environment with many of the limitations without access to computers, though they are surrounded in seeing them. And then the student body is particularly international with connectivity. Um, you know, they have access both to the lived experience and the math online courses. Whenever I have, a, I have to I'll send kids to the courses at MIT. I love the fact that if you wanted them to review something, they have to they go pull out the MIT course, they put up all of them. So I think that that idea of the interface being both very international and then very local, and then the local and the international are um, interacting too is interesting. Other questions? One, sorry, one against the other. How are they played off one against each other? How are they used as this um, kind of mirroring objects? And you, you mentioned the fact that the building is not completed because the people argue, because it's a kind of a, because there is a disagreement regarding the, the end point, but there it's also, I think you suggest, it is very productive because of that, because it's open-ended, because it can accommodate different functions as they come along. Um, so I, I was wondering about this temporality of becoming of the market in relation to the infrastructure, the, the space outside it, the agricultural products that are coming in and out, how it affects the city, how the two objects affect the city. Because I, uh, because what I, I think, uh, I think what happens is, is because people, residents of this area are, are living in many temporalities at at once. Um, so they're 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 living within sort of multiple trajectories of, of eventualities. The eventualities are that they know, for example that more and more people over the past years have been pushed to the periphery of, of, of the region. People like them living in, in those areas. But they know that also those people that have pushed to the peripheries have bought into assets that basically may have 10 years span. That is, you know, they're out in the middle of nowhere, buying cheap houses. The houses are falling apart. People are trying to get back, find a way to get back into the urban core, having a very difficult time doing it. They also know that they could acquire a great deal of money by selling their assets within that district. But then where do they go? You see, they, where do they go? Do they go to the periphery? At the periphery, are they going to be able to engage in the same kinds of economic activities they are presently engaged in? They're living at the, at the, in these interstices of different kinds of eventualities. They know that the market that they run at this point services a, a, a good proportion of the kind of wholesale provisioning market. But they also know that markets also pop up at other places across, uh, across the city. They also know that there's a great deal of pressure as middle class residents come in back to the, to the urban core in large numbers about cleaning stuff up to make things transparent and work. So they know that maybe no matter how effective that market is, that once again, they, they, they don't know the longevity of, of, of that. They don't know to the extent to which the municipality may force them back into the very thing that in some ways operates as a kind of black box for them at, at, at the moment. So in, in some ways, it's not so much an argument about the uh, 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 an argument about finishing or not an argument, it's a, it's a basically a kind of hedging, a kind of sense of we do things together, okay? We're doing these collaborations together. 
These are vehicles that allow us to do this. It's much more important to have a kind of instrument that sustains the collaboration rather than to be a kind of end summation of our, of our accomplishments. Because what does that accomplishment then mean in the end? What kind of value is it going to have? So they're inserting themselves again in these kind of complex interstices of very contradictory, possibly contradictory futures. And that's, in a sense, where the, where, where the, where the mirroring come, comes from, in short. I want to say one word of this two days of the conference, one word that we have really haven't mentioned much, but it made me think of it in that market and your campus, is anxiety, and the campus word of fear of missing out. And the idea that cities increase that, they increase the, they increase the possibilities that you will be fulfilled, but they also increase your awareness of alternative futures that you will never enter into. Everyone experiences that in the, uh, in the city. When I think of my father living in rural Alabama, not having a pair of shoes until he's 13, he didn't actually know that there were very wealthy people in the world. There was, he didn't even know of the existence of the things he was deprived of. A kid in High Rise Project today in Detroit is extremely well aware from the time they're two years old, of many, many different realities that will be very difficult for them to come into. And the anxiety that that increases, and even for people who are on the wealthiest side of this, and the most and the most opportunities, I think the anxieties raised in the city, and I think that one of the things I, one of the reasons I would come here and speak to designers, is I ask you to really, truly think about that, and ways in which design um, can, Hope can enter into that space and not mask and create false senses of safety, but make it more us all more able to deal with the maturity of living in unsafe space with committed engagement. And I think that design can, and a space such as that, I think that project as well as keeping them together is also a place to locate anxieties about choice <coughs> and to, you know, in a secular way, share that. So, touching on anxiety, you mentioned transparency, and the notion, I think, of separation. I, I, I found the um, the hotel incredibly seductive as an as just a space uh, where it seems. So, so Ziggy Johnson seems to have an incredible sense of self, but that sense of self is also inseparable from his sense of the larger collectivity to which he ascribes himself. And I think that's an incredibly powerful thing. And somehow, and I, I don't have this well articulated yet, but it seems to me that this idea of a hotel represents a, 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 an alternative form of domesticity, if you want, that is incredibly powerful. So if if I put the picture of the hotel in contrast with, I think it was the last slide that you showed yesterday, Jane, the sort of basic single family suburban dwelling that everyone wants to have, uh, there's a sense in which I think we need to bring back the question of privacy today, especially when we talk about uh, transparency and the sort of meta regime of transparency that we're all subjected to, uh, that we all, of course, know about, thanks to parts of the study and whatever else, where the space of domesticity, and, and this has been spoken about long ago, Time ago already, but that domesticity is, is not a space of privacy, it's a space of intimacy, as Hannah Arman might say. Uh, and and it, more and more, it's an interface, uh, both in terms of the infrastructures and, and things that circulate outside and within, but also in the way that the house is also a kind of media. It projects, we are to project ourselves through the house. And again, this is perhaps because I'm just moving back to a kind of suburban American place after never having lived in one of those places before. And I feel these anxieties. It's a, it's a really weird uh, space. And I, I find the hotel to be incredibly potential, full of potential as a space of, of darkness, of removal, of obscurity. I think I find that incredibly powerful. So I, I, I don't have a comment, a question. It's more just kind of a comment. I don't know what to respond or not. Yeah, in, 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 in just a related way, it's not the hotel, but it's the boarding house. 
at the boarding house, at least in, in across South Asia and Southeast Asia, has become a, a critical place of inhabitation, particularly for, for youth. I mean, we follow, there are these sort of massive retail centers that are affordable retail centers that usually thousands of young women, 16 to 20, work at. And so we've been, we spent several years following where, where they go. And they're not living at home. No, more, most of them are living in boarding houses, in houses where you might have sharing a room with you know, five, six other women, average length of stay, maybe five, six months, then they move on. Because they circulate through other parts of the city. Because they're not interested in, for them, they, for them it's about being at the right place at the right time. But they don't have any map of that. The only way that you can sort of be at the right place at the right time is to move. And what is the infrastructure that allows you to do it? It's not to be tied down to a long-term rental contract in a particular house. The, the rooming house allows you to pay one month and move on. It allows you to share with other people and, and, and move on. Maybe eventually they'll, they'll acquire something, but, you know, the, and, and, and the way in which, for example, within Jakarta, the amount of the urban core and the near periphery, where everyone, even the poor, turn wherever they're staying into a rooming house becomes, in a sense, the most common form of residency. So it just, it's not the hotel, but it, it is a new, it is a kind of different sense of what it domesticity and intimacy means. And I think ironic freedom, I mean, I, I'm a little familiar with the boarding houses there, because you don't know who's, the, in the suburban and in the country life, you know, their country talks about this, who's cheating who, you know by whose car is parked that side. But when you're in a crowded urban street, just because the street, the car is parked on the street, or you get to walk there, you don't know, and that was the privacy. For Ziggy, his life, as he lived it openly, it wasn't something in his private thing. People coming, so many people were coming and going, no one could tell. You know, whatever 46 people he was interacting with, there are a lot of reasons to be in the hotel. The same thing if you're a girl living in a rooming house, there are many other women there that who's going around. I think how, um, and wider library stacks, I think of, which have become notoriously popular private erotic spaces. Um, I think that is very interesting, is how does the city afford, or do people finally choose that they don't need any erotic privacy, but this self-making in the isolation, the city affords much more isolation than anything but going to a Thoreau, like actually alone in the woods. Because if you are in a community of eight people, you are watched all the time. Small towns are the most observed spaces on the planet. All right, I'm going to take one last question, and then we're going to go into a short break. Yeah, we do have coffee today. <laughs> Um, I have a question about auto construction and self construction, and sort of how, uh, in both of them, they kind of entail uh, an, an urban image that's associated with a community as well. But then, um, for Malik, it kind of gets co opted by um, capital, or like fashion gets co opted. Um, and I'm thinking of like the film Paris is Burning as well. Um, but where these things kind of get uh, co opted in the rebranding of the contemporary city. And I, I guess I just want to hear, to, to elaborate on like the, uh, maybe the distinction or the how auto construction and self construction kind of like follow each other. I want to say briefly, I love this concept of auto construction. And notice I was, you know, wasn't writing a novel and ends with Ziggy's death. And this is the um, like one highly effective man, an effective man of self creation, um, and who's dying in 1968. There's a reason you've never heard of him. There's a reason that the whole world he represented, because of everything you're talking about, the uh, the, the word, say your phrase, I don't want to take your phrase, I love auto. Grand theft auto. Grand theft auto, I love doing it. The grand theft auto, this is what happens post-1968, it's part of. So I want to say that, I think that to me, I was so moved by his talk, because it's what happens next. And we're seeing that um, what was going on from 40, right after the Second World War to 68, did not continue in that space. It may be reimagined another way. But I fully uh, uh, 
I could have folded into it. Zig, it Ziggy, I think Ziggy would have applauded the essay. I, I think also, like, the question of the audience, which is like an originary, uh, an originary condition of the urban or the development of the urban. Um, like, it kind of is uh, this moment of uh, projection that creates this image of the urban associated with um, an urban community. Um, but then somehow uh, blackness gets co-opted in the production of the contemporary city. Like, as I, I think I, as, as I understood in the least uh, talk. Yeah, just quickly. Um, uh, there's a certain aspect of auto construction which takes the form of a sense of community like we're familiar with. But not, but not completely, because in, in, in some ways the auto construction was not about creating a kind of self. It wasn't about creating a collective self. This is not a kind of Jane Jacobs paradise of everyone getting along. I mean, these are tough places, and they're full of conflict, and they're full of inexplicable generosities, but inexplicable manipulations. Um, it's about forgetting the self to a large extent. It's about the willingness of individuals to be a lot of different things at a lot of different times under a lot of different kinds of conditions. It's not about building something that is easily cohesive or coherent. Something that always sort of, you know, roll, is able to roll with the punches. Always able to address the volatility of the larger surrounds. Always able to kind of have a sense that, you know, we, it's not something to be defended, you know, it's not the kind of, not to risk sort of an autoimmune disorder. Um, so there is, there is a sense, yes, of a kind of, of, of a kind of mutual atmality of support, but it's not like, it's not the construction of the, of, 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 of the self. Just as Fred Moten says, you know, the, 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 the blackness of our collective lives has nothing to do with the notion of self. Um, yeah, I think it's actually, I mean, Tupac said, I wake up with every morning a hundred, no, in a, like a, with a hundred niggers plot in my desk. I don't think it has any, I think it has to do with the collective of, I don't think it's collective, I think it's individual and then in interrelation, but it has this radical, and I think it is rooted in America, in the rural South, it's a simple part of imagining yourself being human, when the majority of society says you're not. And I think that that teaches a kind of um, radical imagining and also um, survival what you're, and innovations. But then it's interesting that in the urban environment, it allow, there are new possibilities how that can be used. But I, I don't think that it is, the collective idea, identity is what's put on and what's pushing out all the individual identities. All right, well thank you everyone. Let's give a round of applause.